Well, good morning, everyone. We're so glad to see you this morning. Would you stand and sing with us? Silence is the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high with all creation cry, God. the storm inside of me. Oh, let it rise. Let faith arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God who breakthroughs on our side forever lift him all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. Come on, sing with me. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God who breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we
break into the wild and don't be afraid run into wide open spaces grace is waiting for you dance like the weight has been lifted grace is waiting when the spirit of the lord is there is freedom there is freedom where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom there is freedom come out of the dark just as you are into the fullness of his love for the spirit is here let there be freedom let there be freedom bring all of your burdens bring all of your scars come back to communion To wide open spaces, grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, grace is waiting. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is. as you are into the fullness of his love for the spirit is here let there be freedom let there be freedom oh let there be freedom will fall prison shake at the sound of jesus name lives made whole hearts awake at the sound of jesus name chains will fall prison shake at the sound of jesus name lives made whole hearts awake at the sound of jesus name
touch the lepers then I feel your touch right now you are the same God you are the same God I'm calling on the Holy Spirit God, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as we get ready to celebrate Easter week, we know that that same power that resurrected you from the dead is with us today. And God, I just pray that we would be open to your spirit in this room. God, open our eyes to your presence and to what you have for us this morning. I thank you for each person in this room. I thank you that you see us each as individuals, and you love us endlessly. God, I pray that we wouldn't forget that. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. I'm Josh, one of the pastors, and we are really excited you're here today as we are wrapping up our series, The Grudge, and hopefully you are ready to just be done with the grudges you're carrying around. Um, But before we dive in, there's a couple things I want to let you know about. On your way in, you got a Connect card. If you're with us online, there is a QR code on your screen that you can scan that will take you to our Next Step page um, that will have all the information there that you need Um, to be able to take your next step and to get more engaged in what we're doing. But if you're a guest with us today, we want to say welcome to you. We're just so glad that you would spend your Sunday morning here with us, and we'd love to know that you're here. Um, Our Connect Card's a way for us to follow up with you. There's also um, some next steps at the bottom and some space there for you to share any prayer requests that our prayer team and staff can be praying for um, in this coming week. And if you are a guest, when you walk out today, uh, there is a table with some gift bags on it. Those are there for you. It's just our way of saying thanks for being with us. Um, But while you're filling that out, a couple things to let you know about. Um, One, we do need to celebrate something. So in January, um, we kicked off a class um, called Financial Peace University, and it just wrapped up um, this past week. And so um, we do this throughout the year. Uh, But we had 18 people go through it and graduate and like cut up their credit cards and get like on point with their budgets and, um, and, you know, stop fighting as couples about money. And so we just want to celebrate for those 18 people. Um, You know, that's a huge next step. And so maybe for you, maybe you're thinking, man, like I would love to stop fighting with my spouse about money then you should sign up for the FPU class when it happens next time. And if you want to get on point with your finances and get out of debt, and I do want to say thanks to Bob and Jolene Eddington. They did an amazing job, um, you know, with that class. Bob told me that, yeah, we can clap for them. (laughs) Apparently, they built a a guillotine for credit cards. And so, um, so yeah, we are like all in on making sure that you find financial freedom. So, um, we're not joking around. So, um, but so just want to say thanks to that because one of our goals, I mean, the reason we exist as a church is we want to help you to take your next step with God. And sometimes that is getting out of debt. And that's a part of our faith journey because it affects a lot of relationships and a lot of things in our life. And so we just want to celebrate that. The other part connected with that is just giving. And it's just a way that we give back to God as part of our worship. And so it is part of how we support the mission of, that is going on here. This coming week, you may not realize it, hopefully you do, but this week is Easter. So it is coming up. Today is Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of the Passion Week as we just remember Jesus coming into Jerusalem and just what all this is going to entail. And so this Friday is Good Friday. And every year on Good Friday for our Good Friday service, we do an interactive 
prayer walk called the Stations of the Cross. And so it'll happen in here. Uh, somebody said, oh, is it a walk? Are we outside? It's not going to be outside. It's going to be inside. And so, um, but it goes through, if you've never done it, it goes through the last night of Jesus's life before his crucifixion. And so it is an incredibly powerful um, time. And so it is happening from four to six. You can come anytime in those in that time frame. It is go at your own pace. Uh, we do have a stations for kids under 12. And so, because it can get kind of intense. And so we, we will have um, some station activities for kids under 12 um, so that you're able to go through. And if you have teenagers, I would encourage you to take your teenagers through it. Um, it's going to be a powerful, powerful night. So hopefully you'll make plans to be here. And then on Sunday, we are kicking off a brand new series on Easter Sunday called Change. And so the entire point of the gospel of Jesus and his life, death, and resurrection is that new life is possible. And so um, if you know somebody who needs to change something, this would be a great week to bring them. And so as we're going to kick off a new series on the book of Galatians and look at how the message of Jesus changes us every aspect of our lives. And so that is what's happening. I hope you'll be here, um, and, and I hope you'll just be a part of what happens in this coming week. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll dive in to our last uh, week in the grudge. So Father, I thank you for what you have done in this series. I thank you for the conversations that are being had in our, in our groups throughout the week. I thank you for the way that your spirit is moving and just bringing to mind um, grudges or things that we need to deal with, the shame that we carry um, that as we've looked at just how to forgive ourselves. And even as we looked at last week, how to forgive you, I just pray as we look at the life of Joseph this week and just see how to let go and move forward. God, many of us want to move forward. Many of us want to let go of that conversation, of that moment, of that situation, but we hold on to it. It has become a part of who we are, but it is, it's not freedom. And so I pray that we would experience freedom this week. We would see how your spirit sets us free and how we can let go of things in your name. Amen. So for the last few weeks, we've been walking through this idea of grudges, this idea of forgiveness, and all of us have grudges. I mean, let's just admit it for a moment. We all have grudges. There are people you have grudges against. Maybe you're sitting next to them. You know, you have grudges against yourself, as we looked at two weeks ago. And even last week, some of us carry some pretty deep grudges against God. We look at God and we go, why didn't you stop this? Why did you allow that to happen? How come that didn't play out the way that I thought it would? And we carry all kinds of grudges. And those grudges, I mean, I'll just speak for my own life. Those grudges eventually just become a part of who I am. And I'm not sure what life is like without those grudges. That's what happens. And we carry them for years. I mean, some of us are carrying things. I, I had someone come up to me and say, I have finally found freedom from something that I have carried for over 50 years. And, and that's what happens. And slowly, it just becomes part of who we are. And maybe for you, maybe you don't even remember why you have a grudge against that person. You just know you don't like that person. And we want to let go and we want to forgive, but we struggle because we're not quite sure what that might mean. Because some of us think if I forgive and I let go, maybe that means that I'm pretending it didn't happen. Like for me to forgive and let go means that I need to pretend they didn't say that, pretend they didn't do that. But that's not what it means. And some of us aren't actually sure if we reconciled with that person what that new relationship would look like. We know what it looks like for them to have a grudge against you. We know what it looks like for you to have a grudge against them. But we're not quite sure what a reconciled relationship looks like. And one of my favorite stories in, in Scripture is the life of Joseph. Now, this is not Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. It's a different Joseph. And so in Genesis, at the very end of Genesis, we see the life of Joseph. There are 13 chapters that tell the story of Joseph. And this story is one that for a lot of people brings a lot of comfort. But we skip a lot of the parts of the story and we miss some of the dark parts. Now in the life of Joseph, here's, let me kind of set the stage. In Genesis 37, we meet Joseph, okay? He is one of 12 kids, okay? His dad is Jacob. He has 11 brothers. We're told that Joseph is the favorite child. Now I don't know about you, can raise your hand if you were the favorite child. Or maybe you were related to the favorite child. Right? But, you, but you know this dynamic. And we're told that Jacob loved Joseph so much that he gave him a coat 
of many colors, and he gave him this gift, but he didn't give a gift to the other brothers. I mean, this is like one of the kids getting a car when they turn 16 and the other kids not. And maybe you can relate and you can feel the, the tension in, the, in this moment. So much so that we're told in Genesis 37 that when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now, if you're not the favorite child, you know exactly what these brothers feel. And you're thinking, of course. But here's Joseph. He didn't do anything. He didn't do anything to be the favorite child. And yet he was. And they knew. The writer of Genesis tells us they knew that their father loved Joseph more. And I wonder if some of us, your grudge began when you felt like your parent loved your sibling more. When you felt like that person in your life got a leg up that you didn't get. And you wonder, why is it that that person had it so easy? Why is it that everything they do just turns to gold and everything just goes their way? Why is it that they got that marriage and I didn't? Why is it that they got that health and I didn't? How come they got that bank account and I didn't get it? I mean, here are the brothers going, why is it that our dad loves Joseph more than us? The brothers just didn't do anything. And so I want you to feel this tension because many times when we read things in Scripture, we look at the really rosy parts and we beat ourselves up, but I want you to feel the tension and the angst that this family had. And so Joseph, we're told, like many teenagers, has a dream. And he goes to his brothers and he tells them his dream. And he says to his brothers that, there were, that they were out in the fields and they were working and they were binding together sheaves of wheat and they were tying things up. And all of a sudden, Joseph's wheat stood straight up and his brothers bowed down to him. And when he told the brothers to dream in verse 5, the writer of Genesis says that his brothers hated him even more. Now, this is like in our moments when, when a grudge goes from like zero to 100 in a relationship. And maybe you have somebody in your life that did something or said something and it made you hate them even more. And so then Joseph has another dream and he says that there was sun, there was the sun and the moon and the 11 stars and all of them bowed down to him, including Joseph's father. And it says that his brothers were jealous of him. So at this point, no one likes Joseph. Except his dad. That's it. Just his dad. Everybody else looks at Joseph. He's the golden child. Nothing, he can't do anything wrong. He doesn't have to work as hard as the other brothers. In fact, we're told that the brothers go out as shepherds and Joseph doesn't go with them. So he's the one that like the parents are like, hey, you know what? We didn't pay for college for your siblings, but we'll pay for your college. We'll do things for you. And maybe, maybe you have this. Maybe, maybe you feel like as you've gotten older, your parents did things for your siblings' kids that they never did for you. And so, yeah, we can see why the brothers are mad at Joseph. And so the brothers go out and they're shepherds and they're watching their sheep and, and Joseph's father says, hey, go check on your brothers. So Joseph goes and he, and he walks out and, he, and he's out into the desert, into the wilderness He's looking for his brothers, and his brothers, we're told in Genesis, see him a long way off. And they start to talk to each other, and they say, hey, like, what? here comes Joseph. Here comes that dreamer. What if, what, what if we killed him? What if we, like, finally took care of him once and for all? And the oldest brother, Reuben, says, Let, let's not kill him. Like, let's not kill him. Like maybe you've sat in this conversation with people when you've said like, hey, like what if we hurt this person? Like what if we do this? And somebody says, hey, like what, what if we didn't? Like this is getting really intense. Like what, like I don't know, like maybe we should invite them. Like we don't want to exclude them. Like, But we're told that Reuben said this because he was hoping for a way to save his brother. And when Joseph gets to his brothers, the text tells us that they strip him of his coat they take his gift from away and they threw him in a pit. And then there's an amazing detail that the writer of Genesis says that after they threw Joseph in a pit, 
They sat down to eat. Here, here's what I want, to, I want you to miss, okay? I want you to imagine this for a moment, okay? Just close your eyes for a second. I want you to imagine Joseph just walking out. He's wearing his coat, right? You know, he's got his new, new North Face coat on. You know, he's all set. He looks really great. He's like, check out my coat. You guys don't have a coat. That's what his brothers feel. Look at Joseph. He's just, you know, pomp and circumstance with his coat, just walking out. He gets there, and what do they do? They grab him, and they rip it. I want you to imagine the terror that Joseph felt in this moment. That I'm sure he's just screaming, and he's like, what are you doing? Will you stop? And they're just ripping it. And they're throwing him down, and they threw him in a pit. Now, this isn't a pit where it's like they threw him down into like a cushion. It's rocks that they threw him into that he cannot climb out of. And I want you to imagine as he's in this pit and the screams that he had to be having. That he's just yelling for his brothers. He's yelling probably for his dad. I mean, at this point, he's maybe like 11 or 12. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what happens in Genesis 45 and Genesis 50. He doesn't know how his story ends. And then, I want you to feel the indifference of his brothers. As their adrenaline is pumping and they throw him into this pit, and what do they do? They sit down and eat. And here's what I want you to see. Because there's somebody in your life that said something and did something to you, and then they sat down like they didn't care. They sat and ate while Joseph probably screamed in a pit. And no one moved. The text tells us that no one said, hey, like maybe, maybe we should pull him out. Like, like we kind of showed him, you know. You feel this? Because sometimes we wonder, can I actually forgive the person who is indifferent to me? Who didn't care? And we're told then that a caravan shows up. One of the brothers says, hey, like, instead of killing him, what, like, what if we sold him and got something? And so they sell Joseph. I want you to imagine what it would have been like to pull Joseph out of this pit. Do you think he thought, oh, the, okay, they're getting me out? Just to immediately be devastated when they grab him and put him in chains. See, when you're sold into slavery five, 6,000 years ago, it, like, you're not like given a horse. You're not like, no, you're like in chains walking for miles. And I want you to imagine as he walked in chains, I'm sure he's looking back, just yelling at his brothers, like, what are you doing? And we're told that when this happened, Reuben wasn't there. And when Reuben gets back and he looks into the pit and sees that he's not there, we're told that Reuben tore his clothes and he went back to his brothers and said, the boy is gone, what am I going to do? This is that moment when a decision goes a step further than you thought. This is that moment for Reuben where he thought, okay, like I have this under control, like I got this together, and you go, oh. Now notice Reuben doesn't say, what are we going to do? He says, what am I going to do? And he tears his clothes. And so then the brothers take Joseph's robe, we're told. And they slaughtered a male goat, and they dipped the robe in its blood, and they sent the long sleeve robe to their father and said, we found this. Examine it. Is it your son's robe or not? You feel, like, do you feel like the indifference, the way the writer of Genesis wrote this? Examine this. Is this your son's robe? Like, they just don't care. And my guess is, somewhere in your life, maybe you have a relationship with somebody, part of your grudge and part of the thing you're struggling with is because it feels like that person doesn't care. 
That person does not care the years that they took from you. That person does not care how it impacted you. We're told in verse 33 that his father recognized it. He says, it is my son's robe. A vicious animal has devoured him. Joseph has been torn to pieces. And the brothers don't say, hey, actually, he's still alive. Like, we just, we just wanted to get rid of him. We just didn't like him. We were mad. And then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth around his waist, and mourned for his son many days. See, the thing is, is that all of us and everybody in our life are capable of doing what Joseph's brothers did. You and I are capable of that. You and I are capable of destroying somebody else's life in a moment. You and I are capable of being indifferent. Everybody in our lives is capable of doing this. And maybe you can look back at moments where you made a decision that sent somebody into mourning. Somebody made a decision that sent you into mourning. A moment you can't get back. See, and the hard part is when we read in Scripture, when you go from Genesis 37 to Genesis 39, it's like on the same page in your Bible. And so we get to Genesis 39, and it says, the Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered. And here's one of the things that happens. Here's one of the Christian cliches then is we turn this chapter and we go, oh, you know what? A really bad thing happened to Joseph, but God was with him and it was okay. But here's what I don't want you to miss. I want you to imagine as a teenager being ripped from your life as a slave. The long walk to Egypt. These are the dark nights of the soul where you wonder, am I ever going to put the pieces back together again? Am I ever going to get home? Is it ever going to be like it was? See, Joseph doesn't know how his life ends. He doesn't know what awaits him. He doesn't know where he's even going possibly. All he knows is that everything that he imagined and everything that he ever thought is done. And yet, the writer of Genesis tells us that God was with Joseph. And not just with him, but helped him to prosper. And finally, we're told in Genesis 39.3 that he was sold to a man named Potiphar, who's one of the most powerful men in Egypt. And it says, when his master Potiphar saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord gave him success... In everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes. See, and this is the reminder, the reason that I think these two verses are here is the writer of Genesis knows that when you are in the dark place, when you are in that place of loneliness and anger and grief and sadness, that you are not alone. Now, we look at this as followers of Jesus and we'll say things like, you know what, like that dark place You're exactly where God wants you. And that's true, but I'm sure if the writer of Genesis showed up to Joseph and said, Joseph, you're exactly where God wants you, he's probably not thinking, awesome. All he's thinking is, I want to go home. I want to go home. And part of our struggle with God is that We just want something that we think is just normal and natural, and yet for some reason, God hasn't given it to us. He didn't give us what we thought. He didn't answer us like we thought. But we're told that God did not forget Joseph. And this is important because some of us right now are in this place where we feel like God forgot our story. We feel like God forgot us. And just because you're in a pit, just because you're in that place that feels like slavery, just because you're in that place that feels dark does not mean you're alone. Just because your life did not turn out and your family did not turn out how you thought does not mean you're alone. And notice 
that Joseph's prospering comes because the Lord is with him. And some of us need to take a moment to just say, God, I often forget that you're with me. I need you to remind me that you're with me. But we're told that he prospered. And it's easy, like I said, to read this verse and just go, oh, you know what? Like everything's working out for Joseph. He got to travel. No. He's just a teenager. Putting one foot in front of the other. And then we're told that Joseph continues to work hard, continues to have his integrity. But Potiphar's wife found Joseph attractive and came up to Joseph and said, hey, I lo- you know, my husband's not here. I- come sleep with me. Now, here's the thing. Joseph could have been like, hey, like, nobody knows. It's like going to Vegas. No one knows what, what happens here. He could have looked around and been like, hey, no, one- no one's home. No one's going to know if I sleep with Potiphar's wife. This seems like the natural thing to do. I mean, she's in charge of the house. I'm a slave. But instead, Joseph says, no, I can't sin against God. Now, you you would think in this moment, for Joseph to have this kind of integrity and faith and say, I couldn't sin against God, on a human level, we would look at Joseph and be like, what is, maybe you're thinking, what is God doing for you? Make no mistake that the moment that you are in the darkest place, you are the most susceptible to temptation. The moment that you believe God has left you, the moment that you believe God has forgotten you, you and I are the most susceptible to temptation. Joseph says, no, I couldn't sin against God. And so what does she do? She doesn't just go, oh, well, okay, you know, that's fine. No, she screams and says, Joseph tried to rape me. So he's thrown in prison. And we would think, how could this get worse? But we're told in prison that God has not forgotten him. In verse 21, it says that the Lord was with Joseph and he granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Now, we've talked about this before, but in history, throughout Scripture, Prison is not, not like a great place. They don't have cable. There's not the internet. There's not beds. They don't have to keep you alive. But we're told that Joseph is put in a cell with Pharaoh's baker and cupbearer who have been thrown into prison. And both of them, one day, wake up, and they both had dreams. And they're really distressed about their dreams. And so they tell Joseph their dreams, and Joseph interprets them. And we start to see some of the gifts that God has given to Joseph. And so he says to the baker, he says, you know, you're not going to get out of here. You're actually going to be executed. And the cupbearer is like, okay, well, what's my dream? (laughs) He's like, well, you're going to be restored to your role with, with Pharaoh. And we're told in the text that it happened exactly as Joseph said. And Joseph said to the cupbearer, when you return to Pharaoh, don't forget me. Now, if this was a movie, there would be a narrator voice that would say, and then the cupbearer forgot him for two more years. Joseph sat in prison. And do you think he sat there and thought, man, I'm so glad I have integrity. So glad I made the right choice. I'm so glad I didn't sin against God. Because here's where, here's where you and I sometimes end up, is that we try to do what God calls us to do. We try to do what Scripture says, and then other people don't. And we're like, but it seemed to work out better for them. They seem to be happier. They're not in prison. And some of us, we are in this place. You are in a prison right now because you did what God said to do, and you expected that there was nothing but rainbows and roses and blessing. And what you got was not that. And here's part of the thing is that when we get to that place, that's the moment that our faith becomes real. 
And Joseph's in this prison, not because he wanted to end up in Egypt. He's there because his brothers are jealous. That's why he's there. He's there because his brothers felt like they should have gotten a coat too. And finally, we're told that, that, that the Pharaoh has a dream. And he wakes up and he's sweating and he can't, and, and, he, and he's freaking out about his dream. And he brings together all the, all the wise men and the magicians in the, in the land. And he says, Here, here's my dream. What does it mean? And none of them know what it means. And he says, well, who can tell me? And they, and the, they said, well, no one can tell you. And this cupbearer goes, wait a minute. There's a guy that I was in prison with. Two years. When we wonder how long is this prison going to last, could be two years. And so Pharaoh brings Joseph in, and he says to him, he says, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile when seven well-fed, healthy-looking cows came up from the Nile and grazed among the reeds. And after them, seven other cows, weak, very sickly and thin, came up. I've never seen such sickly ones as these in all the land of Egypt. And then the thin, sickly cows ate the first seven well-fed cows. When they had devoured them, you could not tell that they had devoured them. Their appearance was as bad as it had been before. And then I woke up. In my dream, I also saw seven heads of grain, full and good, coming up on one stalk. And after them, seven heads of grain, withered, thin, and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up. And then the thin heads of grain swallowed the seven good ones. And I told this to the magicians, but no one can tell me what it means. And then Joseph said to the Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven cows are seven years and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams mean the same thing. The seven thin, sickly cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind are seven years of famine. It is just as I told Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will be seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt. And after them, seven years of famine will take place and all the abundance in the land of Egypt will be forgotten. The famine will devastate the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered. And because of the famine that follows for the famine, it will be very severe. And since the dream was given twice to Pharaoh, it means that the matter has been determined by God. And he will carry it out soon. The matter has been determined by God. Still, Joseph has a confidence in God. Which to me is astounding. He still has a confidence in God. And you look at Joseph's life, I mean, he lived it in such a way that he knew that God was with him. And we're told in Genesis, the writer of Genesis says that then Joseph was placed in charge of the crisis that was coming. See, and again, it's easy for us to read our Bibles and just go from this and go, oh, well, you know what? Yeah, like, look at Joseph doing what God told him to do. But one verse where Joseph was forgotten, was two years long. It's not just the next sentence. And I wonder what Joseph thought about while he laid there in prison. I wonder what he thought when Pharaoh looked at him and said, you're going to be in charge of this. And he thinks, wait a minute, like I was just in jail. And the famine is exactly as Joseph said it would be. And it reaches hundreds of miles away to his family. And we're told then that Joseph's brothers come to Egypt to get food. And they come back and forth making multiple trips to get food. And at one point, they walk in and they meet Joseph, but they don't recognize him. They don't know it's him. But we're told that Joseph recognizes them. And I want, you to, I want you to imagine this. Have you ever seen across the room the person who hurt you? Have you ever seen them across the room? Have you ever gone to a family gathering or a party and thought, man, I really hope they're not going to be there? And you walk in and you're like, ah. I wonder what Joseph thought when he saw them. At this point in Joseph's life, it could have been 20 years that have passed.
But he doesn't say anything right away. He doesn't go up to them and say, hey, check this, look at this, guys. Like, I mean, who's winning now? Like, who's got the power now? He doesn't say that. He has every right to. In fact, he has every ability to. Because some of us right now, like, we want to go up to the person that hurt us and say, oh, yeah? We want to let them know that their, their words, their actions meant nothing to us when they did. And finally, we're told that Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And his brothers throw themselves down. And they weep, and Joseph says, no, 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 don't be angry or grieved with yourselves for selling me here, because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household, and ruler over the land of Egypt." Now, we read verses like this and say, well, this is what I'm supposed to get to when I hold grudges and I get mad. But this was decades in the works. And just because Joseph believed God sent him there does not mean it didn't hurt. It doesn't mean it didn't hurt. It doesn't mean that he forgot the fear and terror of the pit. It doesn't mean that he all of a sudden went, you know what, all those lost years with my dad doesn't matter. He's not excusing it. But what he is saying is, I am beginning to see why God sent me here. Now, if you're in a place where you don't yet see what God is doing, don't beat yourself up. Because it took Joseph decades. And it may take you decades to see what God is doing. If you're in a place where you're like, I still don't know why God did that or why God allowed that, be gracious to yourself. It's not a test. But Joseph had every reason to be bitter at this point. And finally, Joseph's family moved. And Joseph was able to be with his father. He was able to introduce his kids to his father, which I'm sure had to be an emotional, just incredible moment. But then we get to Genesis 50, and oftentimes when we talk about Joseph's story, we, it's like, how fast can we get to Genesis 50? But in Genesis 50, there's a finality that comes to Joseph's story because Joseph's father dies. And we're told in verse 15 that when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? Which, I mean, it's a legitimate fear. So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. You know, so let's bring dad into this. <laughs> and he says, this is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly, now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. And when their message came to him, Joseph wept. Now, here's one of the things I don't want you to miss in Genesis 50. Okay? Genesis 50, this family is important because it's, this family is the first moment that forgiveness is given in a human relationship. Okay, if you go back in Genesis... Jacob is the younger brother of Esau. Now, the firstborn in this culture got the birthright, got the blessing from the father, got the land, got the animals. And Jacob stole that from Esau and went on the run. And Esau chased after him to make it right and to kill him and to avenge it. And as years passed, Jacob then takes all of his sons, all of his lambs, all of everything he owns, and he grovels in front of Esau and asks for forgiveness. And Esau grants it. 
And what's easy to miss in Genesis 33 is that jo- Jacob's sons were there. And they watched their uncle forgive their dad. And so Joseph sees what happens in relationships when forgiveness is granted. Because make no mistake, you and I pass down grudges or forgiveness to the next generation in our family. Okay, if you and I don't let go of what our grandparent, our parent, our coach, our teacher did, we will pass that down and all of a sudden our kids and grandkids will look up one day and be like, why is it that we don't like that person? Does anybody even know? Why is it that we don't talk about that situation? Why is it that we don't like ever, like, why do we pretend that person's not in our family? See, I think Joseph had spent years hearing his dad and uncle talk about what happened, and forgiveness had become part of the narrative of his family. You and I sometimes carry things, and you have the opportunity to say, this unforgiveness ends here. This anger ends here. This resentment ends here. I am not passing this on to my kids. They don't need to carry this any more than I do. And I think Joseph wept because there is something, like weeping is something that we need to bodily do. (laughs) Our bodies need to release that. That is a part of the healing process. And after all of that, After all of that, notice the brothers haven't really like come forward and been like, hey, we were so wrong to do this. No, they just said, hey, dad told you you should forgive us. And remember, you're the favorite. He loved you most. Like you should do that. Joseph could have been like, you know what? If my dad hadn't acted that way, like I wouldn't be here. But instead, we're told that his brothers came in in verse 18 and they threw themselves down before him and said, we are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Because notice this, in Genesis 33, when Jacob goes to Esau, he throws himself down and says, I am your servant. The brothers did the exact same thing they saw their dad do. And Joseph's in there going, this is how freedom happens. Joseph said, don't be afraid. I'm not in the place of God. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. You see, one of the things that is so hard, I think, for us is that we read verses like this and and you know, many people love and cling to the promise of verse 20 where it says, you intended for harm, but God intended for good. But again, don't miss, this is possibly 40 years later that Joseph said this. Those words are not a pithy saying. Those words are hard-fought faith. And if you're in that place where you're not there, be kind and gracious to yourself. But also know that just because you don't see what God is doing does not mean that God isn't doing something. Because Joseph had this awareness throughout his life That even though he didn't see and didn't understand, he trusted that God was doing something that he was unaware of. There was a confidence that he had. There was a confidence he had. And I think what the writer of Genesis wants us to know is that it is possible for us to forgive in the most dysfunctional and broken relationships. It is possible. And your forgiveness or your lack of forgiveness does get passed down to 
the generations to come. See, one of my favorite quotes as we think about this whole idea of disappointment is this. And this is one of the keys to moving forward as we end this series. That sometimes to get your life back, you have to face the death of what you thought your life would look like. That sometimes, like Joseph, you have to face the death of this is what I thought it would be. And so as we take communion, as we wrap up this series, I want to invite you to do a couple of things as we respond before we take the bread and the cup. But communion, when Jesus sat with his followers, it was instituted in a moment of darkness and betrayal. And when we take communion, we are told in Scripture that we are to confess, that we are to come to God and say, God, this is, this is where I'm broken. This is what I carry. This is what I bring. And communion is this reminder, is this refresher of, of the grace and the forgiveness that we experience. And maybe for you, you're in this place where you need to say, God, I am struggling to forgive this person. I am struggling to let go. I am struggling. I just want to make them pay. You need to confess that. You need to name them. You need to name the hurt. You need to name and say, God, this is what I'm holding on to. Or maybe you're in a place where you just need to say, God, I, I want to believe like Joseph, and I want to believe that you're intending for good, but I don't see it. And ask him to show you. Ask him to give you a glimpse of what it is that is good. Many times in my life I've just prayed and said, God, I don't see what is good, so if you could please show me, like even just one thing, and to ask. But what Genesis shows us is that in the midst of broken, dysfunctional families, and the book of Genesis is just filled with stories of broken and dysfunctional families. It is that forgiveness is always possible. Reconciliation is always possible. Trust is always possible. But it happens through God's power, but also through our willingness to step into the unknown. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Joseph's story, for his life. And God, I know that many of us are in a place where we can see ourselves in the different places, in different chapters of Joseph's life. Some of us feel like we're in the pit. We're in the jail. We're, we're in the place that we did not cause. We didn't break the relationship. We're not the addict. We're not the one who walked away, and we are the ones that are just stuck and cleaning up. And so I pray for those who are in that place, in that pit, in that jail, that you would remind them that you are with them. That even when it doesn't seem like we're prospering, we know that we are prospering because you are at work. And I pray for those of us who need to forgive, who have placed ourselves in your place, God, and said, I am going to judge them, I'm going to avenge them, but instead we need to say, I, I cannot be in God's place. And I pray for those, I've heard so many over the last several weeks of people just saying, I want to know why. And even though you don't promise us that we will always know why in this life, we still ask. We still ask. And while I wish that it would be the turning of a page in our lives, it's really decades in our lives, just like it was for Joseph. And so we rest that you are in control, that you are not caught off guard, that you knew what we would walk through. You know the valleys that lay ahead. And 
help us to know that you are with us. In your name, amen. Well, when you're ready, I want to invite you to just take communion. Maybe you need to take a moment and just say, God, this is what is in my heart right now. This is the struggle that I have. This is the question. This is the, the anger, whatever it is. And then when you're ready, you can take communion and remind yourself that you're not alone. That there's plenty of grace for you. And then when you're done, you can stand and just sing with us. Just We sing and just remind ourselves and respond to the promises of God.
our guests with us. We have a gift bag for you on your way out. And if you would like to pray with somebody, we'll have members of our prayer team up front who would love to spend that time in prayer with you. We hope that you have a great week and we'll see you back here next Sunday for our Easter Sunday celebration.